This lecture is on PCB assembly, which is the process of mounting and soldering components onto a printed circuit board. So this picture here on this slide uh, shows an example of what's called a mixed assembly, which is a printed circuit board that has both surface mount and also through hole components. Here is a, a board that I have in my office that is a mixed assembly. Um, this component here is a surface mount IC as well as what you see up here. Um, these small little uh, rectangles are also surface mount components. Some are resistors, some are capacitors. But as you can see, there's also through hole components like these capacitors. Uh, this is a I believe this is an FET and then also the connectors okay these connectors on the end of the board are through hole where they have uh, pins that protrude through the board okay that's the difference between the two is that surface mount uh, components like surface mount ICs you can put directly opposite on a printed circuit board where if you have a through hole component like a through hole IC because the pins protrude through the board you cannot put another component directly opposite so a big advantage of surface mount components is that you basically double the real estate of your printed circuit board since you can put components directly opposite and this of course is very advantageous uh, when you have products that are very uh, small and you gotta fit a lot of components in a limited amount of space So um, as I mentioned, uh, surface mount has that big advantage of uh, essentially doubling your board space. Uh, other advantages are that uh, surface mount components now are uh, lower cost than a lot of the equivalent through hole um, components, um, you know, smaller, lighter. Uh, also, uh, since you don't have leads that protrude through the board, there's no need to drill a hole. Uh, in the board so that saves uh, manufacturing costs as far as the uh, manufacturing of the print circuit board and as you'll see in a video at the very end of the of the talk today uh, surface mount also requires simpler uh, automated equipment when it's um, processed in a uh, automatic fashion now that doesn't mean that uh, there's no need for through hole components because there's still a need. Um, you know, often uh, you'll have components that require um, more current capability than what a surface mount component can provide. So uh, it'll have to be a through hole. You know, if it's a large, heavy component, especially. Uh, also, usually fasteners and connectors are also uh, through hole because they have better. Uh, mechanical stability since they actually protrude uh, through the board. Now that's not to say there are some uh, surface mount connectors um, but still the majority of connectors are uh, tend to be uh, through hole. Okay um, one item that I wanted to cover here real quick before we go into you know the various kinds of uh, through hole and surface mount components is just to go over uh, how you would uh, figure out um, figure out the maximum power that a component uh, could dissipate without a heat sink okay because um, heat sinking uh, is also an assembly uh, topic okay you always want to make sure that your components are not going not going to overheat and one common way is to provide a heat sink as you see in this picture here uh, these black um, fins, if you will, they're metal fins. Uh, they're often attached to the back of components like this. Um, this is actually a regulator I see on a uh, power supply board. And the heat, uh, this metal fin acts as a heat sink. It acts like a radiator uh, in a car, okay, where it provides more surface area to dissipate the heat that's being uh, put off by this component here. 
there's other ways to uh, heat sink components. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, products will have like a fan, like computers will have a fan inside to uh, help cool components. Uh, often a microprocessor inside a computer has its own little fan, usually um, attached to the top of it to uh, keep it cool. Okay, but um, as either an EE or CP, it's important to know, like, how would you figure out, like, the maximum power a component like one of these regular ICs or an FET, um, you know, how much power could they dissipate without a heat sink? So the way you figure that out is, is this equation right here that um, it's this ratio of, in the numerator, maximum junction temperature minus ambient temperature uh, divided by the thermal resistance uh, for the component. Now, the ambient temperature, we use room temperature, which is 25 degrees uh, Celsius. And these other two values that you need, okay, the maximum uh, junction temperature and the thermal resistance, you get those values from the data sheet, okay, the data sheet that the manufacturer provides uh, for that particular component. So as an example, um, in the parts kit that you bought from DigiKey, there's a um, FET, a field effect transistor. Okay, this one here. Okay, so I just Googled, um, you know, this manufacturer number of the FET and found its data sheet. And I have highlighted uh, the two quantities that we need to figure out what that maximum power without the heat sink uh, equals. So right here, th the TJ, that's the maximum operating junction temperature. Okay, so you take the high number here, which is the 175 degrees Celsius. And your thermal resistance uh, is down here. Now you gotta be careful because you see there's two here, a thermal resistance for the junction case and then thermal resistance for junction ambient. And that's the one you want, this one right here that's highlighted. And you can see uh, that it's 62.5. And you see the units are uh, degrees Celsius divided by uh, watts. So taking that equation that's on the slide, you just take your um, you take your maximum operating junction temperature, the 175, subtract the ambient temperature, 25. Okay, again, this is in degrees Celsius. Celsius is your numerator and then you divide by uh, the thermal resistance which again is the 62.5 and this has units of degrees Celsius over watts so you do the division and you end up with watts and for this particular um, device it can dissipate up to 2.4 watts without a heat sink so you know you would have to calculate you know what the power is being dissipated in the circuit by that device and as long as it's um, below this amount uh, you don't need a heat sink but of course if it was above this amount then you would uh, heat sink it okay so um, there's various types of through hole components okay here are um, the different types. This uh, DIP, which stands for dual inline package, this is the most popular of the through hole uh, ICs. Okay, and the reason why it's called dual inline is because you have pins that are directly opposite each other in the same line. So, you know, this here, let's see, this is a, a 14 pin chip. There's seven pins on each side, and the pairs are all in line. So directly across from this pin is another pin on the other side. You know, directly across from this pin on the other side is a, is a pin and, and so on. So that's where the name dual inline comes from. Now at one time, uh, you don't see these anymore. Um, at one time, they had these other through hole ICs that stood up vertically. Um, they had what was called a zip, which stands for zigzag inline, and also uh, a sip, a single inline. And these uh, through hole ICs were never around for very long. Um, you know, the dips, the dual inlines, 
they've been around ever since ICs first uh, came about, you know, so they've been around since like the 1960s. Um, of the two technologies, surface mount is the newest of the technologies. Um, surface mount, if my memory serves me correctly, didn't really start um, becoming available commercially until like the 1980s, probably like towards the later end of the 1980s. And then during the 90s and especially the 2000s and up till now, they're very prevalent because again, we have so so much um, electronics now that's uh, you know handheld and uh, smaller than that, of course. So that's where the surface mount really uh, came into play with these smaller uh, devices. So now surface mount is more prevalent than through hole, but originally it was just the through hole components, and then surface mount came after that. Well, in between uh, dip ICs and surface mount ICs were the zip and the SIP, but they really didn't last that long because the surface mount sort of took over and then it just left these dips as as the through hole uh, ICs of choice. I do have, although I don't have a picture of a SIP, I do have an actual SIP here I can show you. Yeah, in this uh, plastic case here, um, here, here's a dip in the upper left. You know, there's the zip, and then there's a sip. So the only difference between a zip and a sip is that the zip has these zigzagged um, pins, where the sip just has the pins that are straight. Okay, so. Um, Surface mount ICs, there's all various uh, types. Um, there's different types of lead styles, and there's also different types of package shapes. Um, so these are all the various uh, lead styles. Okay, you can see there's like, what, four? Um, and then there's also, you know, about four different uh, package shapes. Although you'll see there's some, like, slight variations of some of these uh, packages. Now, there was really uh, what I referred to as an evolution of lead styles along with the packet shapes. And what I mean by that is the following. That, you know, as I said earlier, the through hole technology is the oldest technology so that's where we started but as i mentioned you know a disadvantage of through hole is that you can't put another component directly opposite on the other side of the board because the leads uh, protrude through so uh, the first surface mount style uh, lead was just taking or the thought was you know instead of uh, sticking these leads through the board we'll just kind of bend them out See, so they were bent out so they didn't protrude through the board and then, you know, the solder connection would be made on the same side of the board where the surface mount component is. And that was great because now you could put something, you know, another component directly opposite uh, on the other side of the board. And, and this is called a gull wing uh, type of lead. But then the thought was, okay, well, now we can put something directly opposite this component on the other side of the board, but how about to fit components closer together on you know either side of the board? How about we take these leads and we bend them underneath instead of bending them out? That way I can get components closer together on the same side of the board. So that's where the J lead came in, and that was just taking the lead and kind of bending it underneath and making the connection, you know, um, near like the corner of where this J lead goes underneath the um, IC. And then the thought was, okay, well that's better than the gull wing because I can get components closer together, but how about if I just make the lead right up against the edge of the IC package? And that's what's referred to as the I lead or the butt lead is this type of uh, lead here, where again, we can get things closer now together on the same side of the board. And then it ended up with, um, uh, the last last uh, style of lead, which is putting these solder balls right underneath 
the IC package itself. So now you can, you know, put another IC right up against, or another component right up against uh, this type of package because the pins don't protrude at all out, um, out the side. They're all right underneath. Um, this is the common uh, type of lead style for uh, microprocessors that we'll talk about a little bit more uh, later on. So that was sort of um, like the evolution of lead styles, if you will. And while that was going on, there was also another evolution of package shapes that was happening. Uh, the first type of package shape, uh, like your dips, you know, your through hole type ICs, was just a rectangular type of package. And then uh, they went to a square type of package like this. And then they went to a square package, but where the connectors are right underneath uh, the IC circuit. So the reason for this progression was um, with signal speed, that in high uh, frequency applications, like, you know, um, you know, the signal speeds for uh, like microprocessors, you want to have uh, the shortest uh, distance connections and also you want those connections to be symmetrical because your top speed um, is determined by the weakest link which in this case is is the longest path. Um, components that make up integrated circuits that we'll learn about later called transistors, um, the components themselves are getting so fast that what's determining the overall speed of a of a high-speed system is actually uh, the amount of time it takes the signal to travel um, the connections within uh, that device. So by having uh, the shortest, most symmetrical uh, connections, that leads to uh, the best situation for any uh, high-speed uh, type of device. Okay, so the next few slides are just some various examples of surface mount uh, ICs, various packages along with their leads, you know, different lead styles. So here's um, the small outline package along with Gullwing, and this is an IC, and over here it only has three uh, pins, as you see here, three Gullwing uh, leads. Uh, this is actually a transistor, just a single transistor. Okay, we'll learn starting next week when we talk about IC fabrication that integrated circuits are made up of um, of uh, a silicon circuit with many, you know, thousands if not millions of uh, transistors. Uh, here's some other examples. This is a small outline IC with a J lead. Uh, this is the uh, PLCC with the uh, I lead. Uh, now here's a variation of the small outline package where it's called a thin small outline package. So it's just a low profile uh, small outline type of package. So it just has a very narrow uh, width to it. And you can see it's got gullwing uh, style leads. This is a quad flat pack type of package with uh, gullwing leads. And then this is the ball grid, a ball grid array and there's a variation of a pin grid array where instead of little solder balls as the pins, there's these actual uh, pins that protrude out of the, um, the package. But these aren't meant to go through the board and be soldered like a through hole component. These are meant for um, putting into sockets. Um, so it just makes, uh, you know, makes it more easily to be removed and more uh, repairable. But most microprocessors have this type of package with uh, the solder ball type pins underneath. That's the most um, common for IC or microprocessors nowadays. Okay, well, besides ICs, uh, there's also discrete components, resistors, capacitors, and inductors that are surface mount. And uh, these are how the sizes are uh, are labeled. Um, as you see here, there's like five different sizes, 1206, 0805, 0603, 0402, 0201. And these numbers actually give you the physical dimensions uh, as an example, the 0603s, 
these are uh, surface mount components regardless of what type it is resistor capacitor inductor it's all the same that if it's this size um, it's 60 mils by 30 mils so if you take two the these two numbers backwards it gives you the length in mils and then uh, these two numbers give you the width in mils so this is 60 by 30 mils this is 40 by 20 20 by 10 so the t the 0201s are the smallest um, this is 80 by 50 now it's a little different on this one the 1206s they're actually the largest so it's 120 by 60 okay and students are always like well why did they do it this way why didn't they just say 80 50 60 30 and so on and I don't know <laughs> uh, you know don't shoot the messenger whoever decided to do this they decided to do it this way I'm not sure why <laughs> okay well now uh, those are uh, the components the through hole components and surface mount components now let's talk about how you assemble you know how you connect those components to a printed circuit board so it's done through soldering and uh, you've been practicing soldering in the lab so you have some hands-on with that and as you probably realize soldering is what makes the electrical connection but it's also making a mechanical and, and thermal connection uh, in addition and there's different types of solder um, there's leaded solder and lead free solder uh, the most common types of lead, leaded solder, which contains uh, tin and lead, are the 60-40, okay, so 60% tin, 40% lead, and the 63-37. The 63-37 is eutectic solder, which just means that um, when you heat it up, it goes directly from a solid uh, to a liquid, and then when it cools, it goes right from a liquid and, and solidifies, like there's no pasty stage like there is with um, the other concentrations. Um, the only time that's really important not having a pasty stage is, you know, if you're really concerned about the components moving, you know, as the solder is solidifying. In most cases, uh, the 6040, you know, is going to be fine. Eutectic solder tends to be a little pricey, so I don't know. I've never, in my experience, run into a case where it was worth really spending the extra money for the eutectic solder. The 6040 has always met my needs. Now, the solder does contain a uh, flux. Uh, it's actually inside. It's a rosin material, and the flux purpose is purpose of the flux is just to clean uh, the surfaces as you're soldering them. Okay, it takes off any oxides. Um, and that leads to better heat transfer, which will lead to a better uh, solder joint. There's also a uh, solder that has uh, an acid core, like an acid flux, but that type of solder uh, is not meant for electronics. That's meant for like plumbing and sheet metal work. So never buy, if you're doing electronics work, never buy an acid core uh, solder. You want to get the rosin core solder. And then solder paste is for uh, reflowing when you're doing surface mount um, type soldering. And it's a mixture of solder power along with the flux and a solvent. And we'll talk about what reflow soldering is uh, coming up shortly. Okay, here's some pictures of uh, some good solder joints. Um, good solder joints are shiny and smooth, can have like a feathering out type shape like what's shown in these uh, pictures. Now, I think I mentioned this in my lab intro video to the lab where you did the soldering, but it's good to know, I'll repeat, that leaded solder, um, when you have a good solder joint, looks a lot more shinier uh, than lead-free solder. Okay, lead-free solder has a higher melting temperature, and also it has kind of a hazy look. Even when you make a good solder joint with lead-free solder, it looks kind of hazy. It, it doesn't have like a real shine to it like uh, leaded solder does. Um, yeah, just to show you how important uh, soldering is or how important it can be, uh, back in, well, geez, over 10 years ago now. To me, it just seems like uh, <laughs> yesterday, but uh, back in 2008, uh, the particle collider that they have, I think it's on the border of Switzerland and France, if I have my geography right, um, it was a big deal back then when that was coming online, you know, a big deal in the scientific world for, 
you know, finding out about, uh, you know, because it's a collider that uh, splits like atoms and, and stuff like that. Well, th while they were doing the initial testing, in fact, it was supposed to come online the fall of 2008, but while they were doing initial testing, uh, one of the transformers, um, you know, blew up and uh, it actually delayed, uh, you know, the opening until like the following summer. And uh, that transformer blowing up, it was all due to one bad solder joint. So it ended up costing like 20, 21 million dollars due to one bad solder joint. So uh, good soldering and making sure you have good uh, solder joints is uh, very important. Okay, lead-free solder. As you probably know, uh, lead is a toxic substance. So lead-free solder um, has really uh, been coming about in the last, you know, decade or two uh, because there's more, I think, there's more environmental uh, consciousness now than there was maybe, you know, 20, 30, or 40 years ago. And over in Europe, they have this uh, ROSE, which stands for Restriction of Hazardous Substances, and it requires that companies that do business in Europe, you know, sell electronics in Europe, that they have to, you know, abide by certain rules. And, um, you know, one of the rules is having uh, lead-free solder instead of leaded solder. It, it, this, uh, this rose doesn't only cover um, lead. It covers other hazardous uh, materials. Uh, there's a whole bunch. There's probably like a dozen or so different chemicals that commonly are in electronic products that this uh, this covers. We don't have the equivalent on a federal level in the United States. I mean, it still affects U.S. companies because, you know, a lot of U.S. companies, of course, also sell over in Europe. So they have to abide by uh, this for their products that are sold there. Um, but some states like California have legislation that follows or is very similar to uh, this rose. In fact, in 2007, just a year after uh, this took place in Europe, California uh, passed a similar, uh, you know, similar laws, but it has a narrower uh, scope of products than what the uh, European legislation did. And, and since then, I don't have it on this slide, but since then other states, I know like the state of Washington, I believe, like the state I'm from, Massachusetts, has also passed similar uh, legislation. But there's still not a federal rose-like regulation, and you know most people don't expect it anytime soon because there's a big compliance cost to uh, to to businesses. So, okay, so lead-free solder. You know, of course, there's the health benefits. Also, another uh, pro to lead-free solder is that it tends to stay in place. So you might remember the previous lecture when we talked about PCB fabrication, uh, the solder mask on a print circuit board uh, helps keep the solder in place. Well, lead-free solder doesn't um, tend to flow as much as leaded solder does. So that is an advantage, especially um, when doing surface mount type uh, soldering of surface mount components because it helps to, you know, have the solder basically help the component stay in place by it staying in place. Um, now there are some cons to lead-free solder. Uh, I mentioned one, just high cost of compliance because you got to make sure that all your um, equipment, because of the lead-free solder having a higher melting temperature, it requires different machinery and also the components have to have uh, you know be able the components have to be able to withstand you know a higher temperature since um, it's going to take a higher temperature to melt the lead free uh, solder uh, but also there's another con where lead free solder and the picture shows this uh, you get these crystal crystallized uh, growths that are called whiskers and there have been uh, documented cases of these whiskers actually shorting out, uh, you know, making a solder short, making a electrical short between, you know, two places on a print circuit board where you, you didn't want that connection and have actually led to failures. Uh, on the NASA, NASA uh, government website, um, you can find articles that talk about, you know, three separate cases of tin whisker 
uh, induced shorts that actually resulted in failure of on-orbit uh, satellites. And this is just uh, a little cartoon that I found uh, online. If you've never seen The Wizard of Oz, this really didn't take place. This is just kind of a, uh, uh, I thought, a funny little slide here where the Tin Man has all these whiskers. Okay, uh, continuing on with PCB assembly, now talking about surface mount assembly steps. Um, you know, typically, well, first of all, with uh, surface mount, we use solder paste, and that solder paste is often put on with a stencil. And I'll show you an example of a stencil uh, coming up here. And then, uh, you know, typically the components are placed on automatically with uh, pick and place machines. And then reflow soldering, it's when the solder paste is put on and then later the heat is applied. And with reflow soldering, uh, the heat is applied with uh, an oven. And there's basically two types of ovens. Uh, one uses infrared energy to do the uh, melting of the paste, okay, to do the soldering, the reflow soldering. And another one uses uh, hot air, forced hard air, like a, like a pizza oven. Um, actually, on campus, we have both of these types of ovens. Uh, we have three of the infrared type, and there's one of the uh, hot air type. So let me show a stencil real quick. This here is a, a stencil. Um, it's kind of hard to see the holes, I guess, here. Yeah, there we go, if I hold it that direction. So this is a stencil that um, I actually uh, purchased from Osh Stencils online, which which uh, doesn't have any relation to Osh Park, oddly enough. But um, this stencil here is for one of the uh, boards that I made uh, for the on-campus uh, class. And this costs like $15. Um, it's like an aluminum type of material. It's a, it's a metal stencil. You can get plastic ones for about half that price. Okay, so this is uh, the process of how a stencil is used. So the green here is the print circuit board. And then the light blue, those are uh, the pads that are on the print circuit board. So you lay your stencil on top of uh, the printed circuit board, as you see here, and the stencil openings are aligned with the pads. And then you just put some solder paste, and you take a squeegee, and you just run it across the stencil, and those spaces in the stencil get filled up with the solder paste, and then you just remove the stencil, leaving the solder paste on the pads. And then you would just place your components either manually or you know, there would be a machine uh, that would do it. And in the video at the end of the class, it shows you uh, the machinery that, you know, places the components onto the pad as well as shows you the uh, reflow oven. Now here, see here's that stencil I had earlier and underneath is the board so you see you would line up the stencil with the pad so the the gold that you see within the spaces of the stencil those are the uh, pads on the IC and then you would put some solder paste just put like a blob of solder paste and then Osh stencils this is the squeegee it's just this piece of plastic shaped like a credit card so once you have the solder paste on the stencil, you would just take this and kind of just gently but firmly spread out the solder paste across where uh, the openings are, and then the paste would just fill in those openings, and then you would just lift up uh, the stencil, and that would leave the paste on the pads. And then, like I said, you would place the components. Um, you know, we don't have a, a pick and place machine for components um, on campus. Well, I should say we don't have one that's working. I think over in IME they do have one, but I don't think they've ever actually operated it. 
but over in the EE department, you know, we would just manually place with tweezers the components onto the solder paste after the paste has been placed on the uh, the pads. Okay, so then uh, after the components have been placed on the pads where the solder paste is, then you do the reflow, okay, and that's placing it in the oven. oven. And um, the important thing to know about reflow is that uh, there's what's called a thermal profile, okay, that has four different stages. Uh, the first stage is called preheat, followed by soak, and then reflow, and then a cool down stage. And as what's written here, uh, during the preheat, that's when you gradually increase the temperature. And the reason for this is, uh, you know, this gradual increase is because you don't want to what's called thermal shock uh, the components that if you try to heat up components too quickly uh, they can also they can become uh, you know electrically damaged physically damaged uh, during this uh, preheat stage that's when the flux will liquefy and then it's followed by a soak where you can see um, the rate of increase gets slower okay it's a lower slope uh, increase in temperature and the purpose of the soak uh, stage is to get the areas of the print circuit board um, evenly warmed up so you know the analogy would be that you know if you're cooking say a pizza well you want all areas of the pizza to warm up uh, evenly right so you get a pizza that's evenly cooked well same sort of thing here we want the board to evenly cook if you will um, because if you didn't, if you had some areas of the board that were um, not as warm as others, well, that would probably lead to, you know, some solder joints not getting the proper heat transfer, and you wouldn't have all good uh, solder joints on your board. Okay, and then uh, the reflow, that's when uh, the solder actually melts and, and the solder, uh, you know, is liquefied. And then that's followed by cool down and... Uh, Cool down again is done gradually because you don't want to thermal shock the components. Um, you know, just like when you're heating them up, when you're cooling them down, you want to do it gradually because if not, you could actually uh, damage the components. And also by cooling down gradually, it actually leads to better uh, solder joints. Okay, so through hole assembly, um, the component placement is either done manually or automated. and Again, in the video that's coming up shortly at the end, uh, it will show you the automated uh, equipment that does the um, automatic placement. And then the way the soldering is done with through hole in an automated fashion is with what's called wave solder. And just as the name implies that there's this vat of molten solder that has a rotating drum and it creates this wave of solder and the board is placed over the top. Now they put flux on the bottom side of the board where the solder connections are going to be and then by running the board with the flux on the bottom over the top of the solder wave the solder attaches to where uh, the pads are and where the uh, flux has uh, been placed. Now unlike reflow soldering, wave soldering the heat and the solder are being applied at the same time. Okay, remember with reflow soldering, the paste is put on first and then the heat is applied later uh, in the reflow oven. Okay, so uh, the last part of this uh, discussion is a video. Um, a company called Next, which was founded by Steve Jobs, uh, put out this video. Now it's it, it's basically an infomercial, but it, I think it's a it's a good video that shows a lot of these processes uh, that we talked about. Um, you know, this next company that was founded by Jobs uh, was actually a failure. <laughs> so yes, Steve Jobs actually failed. I think that's very inspiring because we know how uh, influential he was. You know, at Apple with um, you know early. Um, computers and then also of course with the iPhone um, but anyway uh, watch this video um, it's called the machine to build the machines I don't have a worksheet uh, for this video but uh, watch this video 
uh, and again just look for you know the the placement of the parts how it's done by um, automatically by uh, the automated uh, machinery that you'll see and then also you'll see uh, reflow and you'll also see uh, the wave soldering